In the world of mirrors, selfies, two-dimensional portraits, and mirror selfies just as a whole, there's a large attentional bias towards the frontal profile of an individual's face, and this has mostly dominated aesthetic trends. But all too important in the overall evaluation of a face is an individual's appearance from other angles, especially an individual's side profile. This side profile of the face can best be described as the typical jail mugshot from almost every crime movie you've ever seen, including this one. As we can see, the most prominent features that define the side profile are the jawline, the chin protrusion, the height of the nose, an individual's hairline, and other features that would potentially be overlooked in a traditional analysis of beauty. The side profile is more or less reserved for dental and orthodontic evaluations as it's very good at showing your dentofacial growth, and so the average person might neglect that in favour of a more frontal analysis which is what you see when you look at a face, you're not looking at the side profile, you're looking directly into their eyes. For instance, factors that may look perfectly normal from the front can actually be very deviant from the side since if you have a overbite or an underbite, it's not as noticeable if you look at it from the front, but from the side it is very apparent. We could also say the same thing about eye socket protrusion, your forward globe protrusion, your under eye region, your over eye region or the supraorbital region, and so many more things like your forehead inclination. The list just goes on and on. And so for a holistic or a clinical evaluation of a person's aesthetic appeal, I think the side profile is arguably more important than the frontal profile, even though the frontal profile is more practically or pragmatically useful in your day to day life. The side profile can tell you a lot more things that you wouldn't be able to detect from just looking at a face dead on. It's unsurprising then that there's a strong correlation in the research literature between an individual's facial features and their satisfaction with their aesthetic. For example, a Nigerian university study tracked specific elements of oral health, including oral pain, ability to eat, and the ability to speak and socialize without considerable difficulty. The researchers noticed a obvious positive correlation between oral health and the quality of your life. This ties back into what I mentioned earlier about the side profile being a very visual indicator of your dentofacial health. If you have a less than ideal side profile, then chances are that your oral health is also not ideal, your orthodontic alignment is also not ideal, and so your quality of life and your happiness with your aesthetic appeal is also not ideal. A separate Japanese study further looked at notions of facial side profiling, recognizing that groups of adults from different races have a fundamental variation that exists in their craniofacial structure. This particular implication is nothing new because forensic scientists use this all the time, the idea that there are differences in craniofacial structure between different ethnicities and races to identify decomposed bodies or partially deceased remains. And so a similar idea also extends to the fields of dentistry and aesthetics where differences in facial morphology or the physical structure of your face itself have to be recognized between different ethnicities and races. This is quite important because more so than for any other facial aesthetic feature or pose, I suppose, the research on facial side profiles shouldn't be extrapolated beyond the sample ethnicity or population that it was initially tested for. A good example of this is with African faces, where the occurrence of biomaxillary protrusion, where the upper and lower incisors, or the cutting teeth that you have on the front of your <laughs> dental arch, tend to procline or curl outwards, and this is what partially leads to African faces having characteristically larger lips on average. You can then imagine how it'd be difficult to extrapolate these findings to other ethnicities which were either not tested or they just didn't find the same level of characteristic results that indicate that this is something that may be specific to an ethnicity rather than just simple noise in the variation. If you just take a random sample of a million people, obviously a handful of those are going to have some form of bimaxillary protrusion. That would be considered noise in the data set because every data set of anything to do with humans or just anything in general has some form of noise to it. In other words, there are some variations in the data, but nothing significant enough to draw any conclusions on. However, if I were to find an increasing correlation between this type of dental feature forming and their ethnicity, then further research should indicate that there is something that perhaps this formed as a result of evolutionary bias or some kind of adaptation for the African population. Another good example of being very careful with your research is that you'll notice in this paper they mentioned African American. So this doesn't necessarily extrapolate to people as in Africans from the continent of Africa. 
And so this bimaxillary protrusion or the increased recurrence of it in this particular sample population may just be a social thing. So perhaps Americans or African Americans just like the look or if it's something that they do want to get changed, they don't because healthcare might be very expensive and so surgery might not be an option for a lot of people. And so these are actual social influences that you'd also have to consider. So the idea, the main point I'm trying to make is that you shouldn't be extrapolating the data from one particular study to another, especially, especially in regards to the side profile, because a lot of it is dentofacial based and dentofacial is quite influenced by non-hereditary things. So nature versus nurture, in this case, it's more so nurture, or that's what I'd argue from the research. And we actually made a similar video on this where Dr. Weston Price indicated that having a strong, tough, traditional diet like your native indigenous ancestors would have had versus your modern processed diet that any city dweller would have now is very detrimental to your tooth eruption and your dentofacial growth. Another example I'd give just off the top of my head would be with Native Americans who use cradle boards, their early infants, to have them sleep on the back of their head rather than on the sides when the infant skull is very soft and moldable. And so these practices help them grow up into very well-defined, strong dentofacial features and very broad, attractive faces. A first deeper look at facial side profiling comes from a paper by Manevska and colleagues that defined what a balanced facial side profile should look like. The hypothesis of this paper goes that as an individual deviates from the normal balanced facial side profile, there will be an increase in psychosocial issues later on in their life. To measure this, they use what's known as the orthognatic quality of life questionnaire, which was developed in the early 2000s to estimate, as you would guess, the quality of life of patients who have been treated with facial surgery, and in this case, specifically surgery on their jaw and their jaw alignment, all of which are factors which influence your facial side profile aesthetic. When you consider the purpose of cosmetic surgery, it's to improve the quality of life for your patients. Analyzing data from this questionnaire becomes an essential element in having a patient's best interest at hand. The questionnaire uses self-statements to assess a participant's satisfaction, concerns, and awareness with their own aesthetic. When we pulled back into the context of the current study, Manevska and colleagues utilized the measure to see if social and psychological issues were related to an individual's facial profile, deviating away from the norm as defined for Caucasians, although we will look at other populations in just a second. So what exactly is the normal side profile alignment for an aesthetic face anyway? From that study, in this particular table, we can look at three main proportions that they use to consider normal side aesthetic. First is the sagittal face and nose. And so if you imagine that the sagittal plane goes through this way, then the sagittal face and nose is just a spatial relationship between these two units to each other. The lips and the vertical face, which should be also very self-explanatory. Within the sagittal face factor, sagittal referring to a side-on view, we can see that particular measurements referring to the overall angle of the face, the angle of the face in proportion to the nose, and the angle of the nose itself are the dimensions that we should be considering. When looking at the lip factor, elements like the projection of the upper and lower lip are also used, and this is something that we use very extensively in our Coos aesthetics reports because it's quite a useful way of quickly quantifying how much a lip can be deviated by in terms of forward projection, and a good example would be if you have too much lip filler and so your lips stick out excessively, or if you have bimaxillary protrusion, which I explained earlier. For the vertical factor, we can look at the balances between the facial thirds or the actual size of individual units themselves in reference to an anthropological guideline measurement. Say for instance, a guideline for your nasal bridge and length should be around 70 millimeters for your given gender and ethnicity, then we can measure how much the deviance is from that and then assess how that relates to your overall facial harmony as a whole. Here they show some datasets for a Caucasian sample with the angular and linear measurements, but for the Coves report, we'd use one of our 22 or I think it's 25 now datasets to match it to your ethnicity and get the correct values. Before we move on, just a quick reminder, subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying the content and if you haven't already, leave a like and comment on the video if you find it informative. Contrary to popular belief, I do actually read all of the comments. And also, there's a Coup Studio subreddit now, which is 
Great, big shout out to the creators. If you have any questions, you can put it there and I'm sure somebody else can also reply back to you, somebody more equipped to answer your question. But I also take a read and sometimes feature some of the content from it on the channel. So I encourage you to all go there, follow it, show some support and post your content there. Let's go back to talking about side profiles. So in this paper, they had 225 participants and they were sorted into three groups based on their facial side profile alignment. The groups were a concave profile defined by the individuals who had a prominent chin with retrusive teeth and lips having an overall dent with their faces as seen in these examples here. The second group were those with balanced features and as much as a flat profile indicated by no specific outlier features on their face. And the third group, the convex profile who had relatively underdeveloped lower jaw or chin protrusion and a more prominent maxilla or upper jaw, which created, as you would imagine, a kind of a moon face shape. The effect of this underdeveloped jaw is that it makes the nose look a lot more prominent. The overall facial shape of a convex profile can be seen here, creating a lump in the face as seen by the side profile. Now assessing the psychosocial factors associated with these side profiles, it was found that there was no significant differences between men and women for their facial appearance as a whole. What was found, however, was that male respondents with a concave profile were less satisfied with their faces than those with a flat or a convex profile. And when these results are displayed graphically, we can see that the overall satisfaction for men is greatest when they have a convex profile, whereas women have the greatest satisfaction with a flat profile. Now, these results are very, I guess, quite surprising to me because you'd expect that men would want more, well, generally stronger jaws and more of a neutral balanced face shape which is something you'd get with the obviously the flat or the straight profile whereas the concave profile emphasizes the weakness of the jaw and so for that reason i think we need to look at other studies with other geographical region and populations this was again remember a caucasian sample so i expect there to be some differences in other ethnicities now if you think back to that mini stats class i gave at the beginning of the video one part of paying attention to the research is knowing when to call out the details here, while it does suggest that males prefer the convex profile and females prefer the straight profile, the differences are actually statistically negligible. So in other words, it's not really telling us a whole lot and we're going to have to look at more studies. One study by Altaki and colleagues in 2014 suggested that the straight profile is the most attractive between both genders for the United Arab Emirates population. Similarly, another study by Tareja et al. looked at an Indian population for their preferences in a side profile and found very similar findings. In both sexes, the orthognatic profile or the straight profile was the most preferred. In males, bimaxillary protrusion is considered the least attractive and in females, protrusive maxillas or the upper jaw are considered the least attractive. And lastly, in the Indian population, the position of the mandible or your lower jaw is much more critical in males than that of the maxilla or the upper jaw, which is the reverse for women. From these results, there's quite unilateral consensus between doctors, surgeons, dental students, and the general population, but more or less, there's a bit of a deviance between the general population and the medical professionals. And we've seen this time and time again in many different research papers where medical professionals such as orthodontists have much more stringent requirements for what an attractive face is versus the general population and that's because they look at things more from a numbers and quantitative point of view whereas the general population looks at faces from a more holistic and qualitative point of view as in does this face just look attractive to me or not most interestingly to me however is from Farrow et al's paper on bimaxillary protrusion in black americans where if you remember at the beginning of the video i mentioned the topic of bimaxillary protrusion which gives the face quite a projected lower third and this is partially for what makes the lips look larger. And what they found in this particular paper is that black Americans prefer a straighter profile than what has been measured as normal for their race. In other words, they would like to more often than not have this bimaxillary protrusion reduced, which again is in consensus with all of the other studies where humans just generally prefer a straighter facial profile rather than a convex or a concave one showing a degree of unilateral support that you wouldn't expect despite these populations being made up of very different parts of the globe. Mansikos 1998 looked at a Japanese study, found the exact same thing, although the sample size was a lot smaller, but these results also showed a very similar preference for a orthognatic or a straight facial profile 
And again, this agrees with everything we've seen so far with every different geographical region. What's interesting to me from a statistics point of view is that despite this sample size being very small, they still found very significant or statistically significant results, meaning that this innate desire for wanting a orthognatic or preferring a orthognatic and straight facial profile must be quite important because we're detecting it in sample sizes with very small percentages, meaning that they have weak statistical power, yet we can still detect such a similar result. We can detect it in very large sample sizes with a lot of statistical power, meaning that when the test is very sensitive, we can detect it over a very large population. Even when the test is very insensitive, we can detect it over a very small population or a sample size in this case. What we can take from these findings is that to a degree, the facial side profile evaluation is important, but it doesn't exert enough influence by itself in most cases to significantly affect an individual's satisfaction with their facial aesthetic. However, it can affect an individual's objective measurement of attractiveness. The key differentiator being individual satisfaction versus individual attractiveness. One such study from the British Journal of Orthodontics assessed the relationship between the side profile and facial appearance, much like all of the other studies we've looked at with a slight difference. As the journal pointed out, variations in an individual side profile and their aesthetic can depend on the aspect, in other words, the individual's facial expression, posture, lighting, growth, aging, and of course, changes due to surgical treatment, which is the part that we've really looked at in the other papers and in our video on dual prognathism. Although, conclusions from that paper stated that as an isolated reference, so the side profile just by itself, an individual's side profile is not sufficient as a judgment of facial aesthetics. They suggested that the side profile may serve to predict certain traits of beauty, including the proportions of the nose, the upper and lower lip, and the soft tissue chin, which can affect the overall balance of the face. The paper suggests that the best predictor of an individual's facial aesthetic is actually the three-quarter face view, which can accentuate an individual's jawline and cheekbone. So instead of taking your photographs from dead on, much like any modeling agency or photographer will tell you, it's actually better to take the photo from a three-quarter view. Partially, this is because not many faces are perfectly symmetric, and so a three-quarter view can hide a lot of those flaws but also because it accentuates the jawline much more than the side profile alone and much more than the frontal profile alone can. What we're really seeing in the research is that the frontal profile is still more important in your day-to-day -day life than your side profile because you're not going to be looking at somebody's side profile more than you look at their frontal profile if you're talking to them in a one-on-one -on -one socialized setting. But that doesn't mean that your side profile isn't important, it's just used to measure a different type of aesthetic appeal, which is in the form of your dentofacial alignment, which is something that's more biologically ingrained into us from what we prefer in our faces. And as it turns out, regardless of what geographical region we're looking at, there's very strong consensus in people preferring straight facial profiles, such that the sagittal relationship between the upper, lower jaw and the cranium itself is quite balanced. Now, I, I suppose a lot of you did expect this video to go more of it into the angles and the measurements and the jaw angles and all of that stuff, but we've looked at all of that in our previous videos. For instance, the ideal jaw angle was covered in this, and then the ideas of jaw prognathism was covered in this. And so the main focus of today's video is really to look at the influence of facial convexity and concavity in how that influences your social perceptions. Having misaligned dentofacial features is quite a significant factor to your facial attractiveness, and so if this is in your case, it would be in your best interest to have it corrected. If you'd like to learn more about your facial profile and your facial aesthetic overall as a whole, then I recommend that you go to the Coos website and order a facial aesthetics report where you can get detailed feedback from our team of orthodontists, dentists, and doctors and get a tailored report that looks at all of these different proportions and aspects of your face and be better educated on your facial aesthetic. Also, if you haven't already, I recommend you catch me on the podcast on Patreon, where I talk about many different fringe aspects of the facial aesthetics sector and the research literature. I bring on guests and researchers to talk about their findings and some of the limitations that we see in the literature itself and how this can be used to apply to the general everyday person.